Welcome to Adopt a Rock House Volunteer Training, Part 2. This video will cover the human history of the Red River Gorge. The Red River Gorge's unusual geologic features, like its sandstone cliffs and its rock shelters, as well as the difficult terrain and the extreme elevation changes, have played a pretty big role in preserving fragile ancient materials that otherwise would decay away in most archeological contexts. So at the gorge, you can find things that you wouldn't normally find pretty well preserved, such as seeds, nutshells, cordage, wood, leather, and textiles. If you're interested in archeology, span be sure to visit the Living Archeology span Weekend website. All of the human use history information provided in this training has come from two documents provided by that organization, and they are the stories from Dry Places, the Red River Gorge's prehistoric rock houses, and Living in the Red River Gorge, an archaeological story. Human use of the gorge can be documented back to 12,000 years ago during the Paleo-Indian period. This is when the first people were arriving to the Red River Gorge uh, as the last glaciers were retreating. Unlike today, the Red River Gorge was actually covered in evergreen forest with large megafauna, such as mastodons, mammoths, and giant bison. The Paleo-Indian peoples lived in small groups that traveled from camp very often. They fashioned their belongings and their lifestyles to be portable due to the frequency of their travels. And hunting was primarily done with spears with stone points at this time. The next period in time went from about 10,000 to 3,000 years ago. It was called the Archaic Period. By about 10,000 years ago, the climate had begun to warm up, and so those evergreen forests with their megafauna began to be replaced by our modern-day deciduous forests with our modern-day fauna. Similar to their ancestors, the Paleo-Indian people, the Archaic peoples were mobile hunters and gatherers. For more effective hunting, they developed a new weapon, the spear thrower or the adult adult. And you can see a diagram of that in the top left here. The archaic peoples prepared nuts with ground stone tools called bedrock mortars or hominy holes that you can see on the bottom left. Some of these hominy holes still contain residue from foods processed within them by the archaic peoples. People set up their camps in rock shelters at the base of slopes along floodplains. Larger groups lived at base camps for a season, and then smaller satellite groups camped in different places for shorter periods of time as they collected particular food items and other resources that they would bring back to base camp. As the centuries passed, archaic peoples came to rely more on plants for food. They would return to the same patches to collect seeds and fruits and they would go to the largest and most productive patches of plants. The people's choices may have been intentional or not, but over time, their choices began to change the plants physically, and this was the beginning of plant domestication. The next period is the woodland period. This went on from about 3,000 to 1,000 years ago. Around 3,000 years ago, the people began to make jars from local clays. Ceramics would join wooden and gourd bowls and cane baskets as the containers that they used for cooking and storage. Hunting and gathering continued to play a major role in the economy of the woodland people. They replaced the adult adult for hunting with the bow and arrow. The woodland people planted gardens near their camps. They would cultivate squash and weedy annuals such as goosefoot, marsh elder, sunflowers, amaranths, and knotweeds. Dried plant and fecal remains found in these ancient sites show a dramatic increase in the role garden plants played in the people's diet at this time. With a predictable source of food, the people began to live in camps for longer periods of time. They began to make short trips to other places for other raw materials they would need, but they would always come back to base camp. Hundreds of rock shelters along the many cliff lines of the gorge provided more than adequate shelter for people. Archaeologists have been able to identify many important woodland camps there. 
At these sites, the remains of woodland people's storage pits, trash pits, and the fires they built for heating, lighting, and cooking have been found. They have also discovered pottery, spear points, cordage, textiles, leather items, grass beds, and a wooden cradle board, which was used for carrying for babies. In addition to its dry rock shelters, the gorge is also known for its rock art. Archaeologists think that the woodland peoples uh, were the ones who carved or chiseled images into boulders and cliff walls. These petroglyphs are mainly geometric designs like circles and spirals. They also get turkey, deer, or bear tracks, and more rarely, human footprints and figures. The next time period, the late prehistoric period, occurred between 1,000 and 300 years ago. Within the gorge, people lived in rock shelters. The prehistoric farmers of central Kentucky also may have come to the gorge to hunt at this time. At the William S. Webb Memorial Rock Shelter and Ray Spirits Rock Shelter, small groups set up temporary hunting camps and they left behind triangular arrowheads, grinding slab, a few ceramic jars, as well as corn husks, corn kernels, cut cane, and cordage. By about 400 years ago, Native Americans were trading with Europeans indirectly. Evidence of this contact comes in the form of European glass beads and metal kettle fragments. Unfortunately, European diseases like smallpox, influenza, and measles appeared in the late 1600s. Thousands of people died because they had never been exposed to these kinds of diseases before. Early European Settlement and the Frontier. After the first epidemics had passed, some native groups may have continued to live full time in the area. They may have hunted in the gorge as their ancestors had done, and they would have traded their deer skins to colonials at trading posts. European pioneers arrived in Kentucky via the Ohio River and the Cumberland Gap. By the time pioneers arrived in large numbers, native peoples had moved many of their villages north of the Ohio River. Like indigenous peoples, most of the Europeans who settled in the gorge area also made their living farming. Their crops included corn, tobacco, hemp, flax, and wheat. They also raised livestock such as cattle, horses, and hogs. They even used some rock shelters in the gorge as animal pens. People started to mine for saltpeter or niter, which can form naturally in caves and rock shelters and is one ingredient in gunpowder. The miners processed the niter, then shipped it to places like Lexington, or they used it themselves in hunting, curing meat, and treating ailments. In the gorge, Europeans mined saltpeter at D. Boone Shelter, a well-known and protected rock shelter. The vats and crushed rock are still there. Pine tar was made by burning pine trees under pressure in kilns. Charcoal and tar were produced. People used tar in many different ways, for sealing wooden buckets or boats and in roofing construction and maintenance. Tar also had domestic uses, such as a lubricant for wagon axles, as a decay preventative on fence posts, and as a cleanser. Pine tar production in the gorge is interpreted near a former kiln site along Tunnel Ridge Road. The Civil War and Before. The population of the gorge at this time was likely very small. Farm sites were not numerous since the narrow bottomlands and dry ridge lines do not provide much tillable land. Pine tar production continued. It is not clear whether systematic niter mining occurred at this time since neither the Confederates nor the Union would have wanted a gunpowder source to fall into the enemy's hands. It is possible that guerrillas or local people produce saltpeter and gunpowder for their own consumption, but no one has yet found proof of this. The three counties within which the gorge is found, Menifee, Powell, and Wolf, were created in the latter years of this period. After the Civil War. In the gorge, farming alone could no longer financially support people, and many farmers were forced to search for wage-earning jobs elsewhere. The iron industry moved into the gorge region during this time. The Red River Iron Works in Clay City claimed to be the largest of its kind in the world in the 1870s, employing more than a thousand workers. The major industry in the gorge at this time was logging, which initially did not advance deeply into the gorge because of its difficult terrain. 
With the railroad and the construction of Nauta Tunnel in 1911, it became much easier for people to get goods and services and to get in and out of the gorge. Evidence of past logging activities takes the form of splash dams, logging related residencies and communities, and logging trails and roads. By the mid-1870s, a small community developed at the confluence of Glady Creek and the Red River called Glady. At one time, Glady consisted of a post office, a school, and a cemetery, along with the houses and farms of its occupants. Today at Glady, you can see the Glady Cabin, assembled in the late 1900s. It consists of portions of an original cabin, once used as the post office, and sections of other buildings from the community. Glady became a part of the Daniel Boone National Forest in 1987. Industrial and Commercial Consolidation. As urbanization increased throughout Kentucky, more people in the gorge work wage earning jobs in nearby towns and cities. Farming became more mechanized, but as an occupation, it continued to decline in importance. One way farmers could supplement their decreasing agricultural income was by distilling alcohol from their grain crops, such as corn, wheat, and rye, into moonshine. The gorge was a good place for alcohol production. The rock shelters where they made the liquor were isolated and water and firewood were easily available. With prohibition in 1919, it became illegal to make, sell, or transport alcohol. The remains of old moonshine stills are present today in some of the rock shelters in the gorge. By the 1920s, the industrial era of the gorge was ending. The timber was generally logged out and oil and gas fields were depleted. During the depression, the federal government established programs to provide jobs to large numbers of people. The Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC, established in 1933, built two bridges, Tunnel Ridge Road, two powder houses, and a quarry in the gorge. In the 1930s, the public considered the log areas of Menifee County a wasteland. So the U.S. Forest Service began buying up land to establish the Cumberland National Forest and started a program of reforestation. In 1966, the Forest Service renamed it the Daniel Boone National Forest. The National Forest Tourism and Recreation Era. The United States established the national forest system to create a perpetual logging industry for the United States. But in the latter part of the 20th century, people began to visit national forests for recreational purposes. The Red River Gorge was no different. The gorge has a long history as a tourist destination with people visiting Natural Bridge as early as the late 1800s. Natural Bridge State Park was established there in 1926. The construction of the Slade Interchange on a mountain parkway in the 1960s also helped open the gorge up to more weekend visitors. Estimates of the number of visitors to the gorge each year range from 250,000 to 750,000. One of the gorge's major attractions is its cliff lines and the rock climbing opportunities they provide. Some people consider the Red River Gorge to be among the top five climbing locales in the world. From the time climbers established the first climbing routes in the gorge in the early 1950s and 60s, people have traveled from all over the world to try their skills there. Other tourists visit the area for its hiking trails, camping spots, and for the gorge's scenic beauty. Expanding visitation and recreation in the gorge since the late 1970s has increased impacts to its fragile prehistoric and historic sites. Looters have routinely mined rock shelters for artifacts to sell or to add to their own collections. Campers' overnight stays and the activities of rock climbers also impact these sensitive places. Today, private citizens own 21% of the gorge. This means they have the challenge to protect the cultural resources on their property. The Forest Service manages and protects the resources on federal land. It is meeting those responsibilities in several ways. In 2004, it closed all rock shelters to camping. Aided by the Federal Archaeological Resources Protection Act legislation, Forest Service personnel have successfully prosecuted several people caught looting shelters in the gorge. To educate visitors about the gorge's cultural heritage, the Forest Service has held Living Archaeology Weekend annually since 1989. And in 2004, it opened the Glady Cultural and Environmental Learning Center. 
The Forest Service and partners safeguard the gorge's cultural and natural resources for the future. They want to preserve what is unique about the gorge, but they also want to give everyone the opportunity to experience the beautiful landscape of the Red River Gorge for many generations to come.